The following was an evening darshan given by His Holiness Jaya Bhattaka Swami on September 17, 1983 in Atlanta, Georgia. Tonight is the eve of Vamana Dwadasi. Our fast today on Akadasi counts for tomorrow. I was present when Srila Prabhupada was lecturing on Vamana Dwadasi. That's when he started to discuss Vamana Day. Vamana, is it Vamana Dwadasi or Raha? Vamana. As I mentioned, I was in Kerala during the Onam festival of Bali Maharaj is celebrated. So in some parts of India the Vamana Avatar pastime is so big that it's like their Christmas. There. The things connected with Bali Maharaj and Vamana Day it's their biggest uh, holiday. So of course Vamana Day when Prabhupada he started discussing about Vamana Day, then he said that well if we discuss about one of the uh, incarnations, the avatars. We have to discuss about all of them. Because uh, ultimately, they're all coming from Krishna. Different pastimes, different purposes. So, Vamana is uh, when Krishna came as a dwarf, Brahmana, in the society of the demigods, the whole pastime of Vamana Dev and Vali Maharaj. Vali Maharaj was the grandson of Prahlad, but as such he was the king of the demons. Prahlad was the, the son of Hiranyakashipu, who was the demon. In the universal situation, there are specific races of people who are basically demonic. And in the Bhagavatam it mentions that there's a class of living entity called an Asura. And these Asuras are more powerful than even subordinate demigods like Gandharvas and others. And they have their own planets. They have mystic powers. They can travel sometimes from planet to planet. They, they're my, I mean, a human being is, you know, one-tenth of a percent compared to these people. They're very... So they're the only people that uh, can sometimes defeat the demigods, but normally they don't defeat them. Normally they're defeated, but there's always a rivalry between. So Prabhupada used that to point out that even Indra Dev, because he's a devotee, but he's a devotee with material desires, that he's always in conflict with these asuras. He's always fearful, but this time, because Bali Maharaj, he did uh, worship to Vishnu, he followed the instructions of his guru with complete faith. He became insurmountable. And he defeated Indra. When Indra went to his guru and said, what can we do? The Bali is defeating us. He said that you can't do anything now. Because if a person has complete faith in the guru and follows instructions like that, then there's nothing that can stop him. So you have to wait because there are suras, because they don't... For the time being, they're following regular principles, they're doing the things accordingly. You can't stop them. But they're going to make mistakes because they're not pure. And when they make a mistake, that'll be your chance. So you better right now just retreat, otherwise you'll just use all your energy and you'll be permanently crippled. So then uh, the mother of all the demigods, uh, Aditi, she started to you know, pray to Vishnu to help. She had to do a big puja to get Vishnu to come and be her child. So she was able to have Vamana Dev as her child. And Vamana Dev, of course, went to the kingdom of, uh, to the palace, to the uh, place of Bali, and it, as a small boy, as a, a dwarf, asking for, uh, he said, you can have anything, because Bali was very uh, generous. He would give charity uh, profusely to the Brahmanas. 
you see. Even the Vedic time, even the Asuras knew that by giving charity, they're going to get a lot of pious activities. The idea that they they knew the law of karma. You see, that they're not like the modern the atheists who don't know anything, but they knew the laws of nature, laws of karma, so they give charity. They would build up punya, but then they would use that practically even in defiance of God. They would even exploit God for the for their own purpose. But they would, you know, it would ultimately not be for His purpose. There would be no uh, surrender. Bali was like kind of a, as this grandson of uh, Prahlad. He's actually a real devotee at heart, but he had brought with him all of these demons. So Bali Maharaj, when he was uh, offered the opportunity to give charity, he said, "You can take whatever you want." He said, I only want three steps of land. So why don't you ask for more? You can have a kingdom. You can have so many things. Why why just three steps of land? What's the value of that? So no, whatever I can cover in three steps, just give me that. So then Sukracharya, his guru, told them that no, if you do that, then this is actually Vishnu in disguise. You lose everything. You'll take everything. You can't He's looking like a little dwarf now, but his potential is unlimited. It's actually God in disguise. He's coming like this for his own purpose, to actually benefit the demigods. But if you uh, agree to his proposal, you'll lose everything because uh, he's got no limit. And then Bali said, what kind of guru are you? The whole life you've been telling me to worship God. By worshiping, I came, uh, became the ruler of the whole universe. And now you're saying he came himself in disguise. And he's asking three steps of land not to give it to him. And lie, I've already said I'll give it to him. He says, well, you can lie sometimes. <laughs> then he gave the reason of different circumstances you can lie. He says, sometimes you have to lie to your wife or, you know, flatter or something. And sometimes you have to lie to a friend if it's going to save his honor. Maybe sometimes you can, he gave all the different times when you can lie, <laughs> you know, in normal soul. He said, well, this is a different thing, but I'm not going to lie to God. He says, you can lie, you know. When you're saving your life, say you're, you're caught and it's life or death, or something, well, you can lie just to save yourself. This is like that, you better lie. Just tell him you can't do it. You said it, but you take it back. He <laughs> said, no, he says, I can't, uh, I can't maintain that. So then, uh, of course, after that, in Vamana, he expanded to the size of, uh, that he covered in one step the whole planet, the next step the whole universe with his body. And Vama and the Bali had the vision given where he could see that Vamana's form by the Visarupa universal form of one sort manifested that uh, how the total energy of the universe was part of uh, was part of uh, Krishna and how this form of Vamana had spread out through the whole universe so there was no space left everything was covered then he came back and uh, said so now where do I put the third step in two steps he had already taken every. So then Bali said, there's only one place left. He says, you put it here, put it on my head. And uh, because uh, he surrendered everything, so when we have the nine practices of devotional service, Ravana, Kirtana, Smarana, Bandana, Pada, Sevana, Dasya, Sakyam, Pujam, Dasyam, Sakyam, Atma, Nivedana. The Atma, Nivedana means to surrender everything. So Bali Maharaj is used as the example of surrendering everything. He didn't do any other devotional service per se uh, at that point. But explicitly, I mean, what he did, the main thing, he completely just surrendered everything. Okay, I give myself. Do with me what you want. So, of course, then Krishna, he became even his doorkeeper. He said that, all right, you leave this place and I'll give you your own planet. And that planet will be better than this place. Because, you will, because even Indra... And you, you always have to fear Indra's going to attack you. And Indra always is fearing you're going to attack him. So you be there, and I'll give you a whole planet. And just to protect that no one can attack you, I'll personally ha have be there with my Sudarsha and Chakra. You don't have to worry about anyone attacking you. Like that, ultimately, the devotee never perishes. Krishna promises the devotee protection. So whether Prahlad Maharaj was protected by Narasimha Dev, Mother Earth was protected by Baraha, all these things may seem very fantastic, you see, but because uh, 
ultimately if we understand that the poten potential of Krishna to do something is unlimited, therefore nothing is really fantastic, nothing is uh, impossible for him to achieve. But if we don't understand that basic uh, potential of the Lord, then of course everything seems pretty fantastic. But nowadays we're having so many different types of movies, science fiction. People are speculating different things. It seems very wonderful to watch all these different, you know, $75 million in special effects. The Return of the Jedi, right? All these different things. But uh, what's the actual value? It's actually, I mean, India, they would show Ramayana, Vaman avatar, different avatar, but they don't have the technology, so they, it always comes off very corny when they try to do the special effects. But actually the people would go and uh, they would get a lot of spiritual inspiration just from these different movies. When they first came out, mo majority of the movies were religious. Now they got into social and their love movies and so on. But uh, originally the religious movies were the most prominent kind of break into the market. Now gradually they're degrading. Still the biggest sellers are the religious movies. But uh, that way, rather than just going into some kind of uh, useless thing, even in the West, Prabhupada wanted that sometime there would be a, a Bhagavad Gita movie. So you have the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita. Ending with Krishna speaking uh, in the Bhagavad Gita on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. There's a big scope for giving people spiritual knowledge. The Vedic idea is that you don't have to have other type of entertainment. Your entertainment itself can be completely spiritual. And a person can be completely satisfied. At the same time as you're being uh, entertained, as so to speak, you're being... Uh, you're having an outlet for your your mental and visual and other sensual expression. You're at the same time absorbed in transcendental meditation. This is possible in Krishna consciousness. In the impersonal system, then it's not very practical. Either you stare at a candle or look at your nose or you meditate on the nothingness. So then what happens is that actually promotes uh, sense gratification. Like when you preach to the Buddhists, they have a very strong boga tyaga syndrome, enjoying renouncing mood. The system of their monks is that when you become a monk, then you have to abstain from, uh, from uh, so many things. You have to abstain from sex life, you have to abstain whether you're a monk or a nun. I have to abstain from uh, drinking alcohol. I have to abstain from... Many of them are vegetarians. Some of them aren't nowadays. Many of them aren't. They're not that strict in their diet. But they have to go begging. But what they'll do is they'll become a monk for one month or two months or three months. And then after a while, then their passions will grow. Then they'll give up their dress, go out and they'll do complete boga, complete sense gratification for a period of time. When they get tired of that, then they go back to being a monk. And they go back and forth like that, you see, until finally they get so frustrated that they want to commit some kind of spiritual suicide, which is what they call nirvana. Nirvana actually is a spiritual suicide. That's when you want to completely disintegrate your existence. So in a, in a uh, impersonal situation, actually sense gratification is promoted because there's no, nothing attractive about self-realization. It's just on the basis that material life is so much suffering. When a person goes for enjoyment, it ultimately they suffer so much. Heartbreak, various uh, material diseases, various problems, that it becomes so frustrating. Just like today they're saying that amongst uh, high school and college students, suicide is at an epidemic rate. According to someone who was mentioning today that they did a study, and the third greatest cause of death in America after car accidents and after what I, I don't know what heart they're... Disease. Huh? Heart disease is suicide. Right? That means that people are so frustrated that uh, they're committing suicide in, in, a, in such a huge number. 
And they said that if you actually went into the accidents, you'd find that 30% of them are actually people willingly, you know, by, they're calling an accident, but actually it's a suicide. So it's probably in the number two place. There's a, uh, in, uh, I heard that in, in Sweden, the suicide rate there, any pressure comes, people commit suicide. There's some tremendous percentage, like uh, 5% of the people commit suicide. I don't know, some, maybe that was just of psychiatrists there. But there's a certain very high suicide rate in Sweden also, which is considered to have a higher per capita income than America. It's very impersonal there. So the desire, why should a person suffer? I'm trying to be happy, but instead I'm suffering. So then instead of committing just suicide, then the impersonal school, they said, all right, you actually, spiritually, you merge into uh, some energy source or into... Uh, nothingness, if it's Buddhism, it's the nothingness, a nirvana, and if it's uh, Vedic impersonalism, it's into the Brahma Jyoti, the spiritual light, you see. So what Krishna consciousness is actually, it shows a spiritual reality, which is, uh, which is uh, filled with so many transcendental qualities, which actually satisfies. But when a person is first coming into spiritual life, then they fear that, oh, this is uh, another, it's going to be another frustration, it's going to be another personal relationship, uh, various uh, type of uh, frustrations are going to come because it's uh, must be material, it's got so many qualities and people and personalities and, and they already come prejudiced from their material frustration that because this has got uh, varieties and qualities, they must also be of a similar frustrating nature. See, that's the contamination of impersonalism, that they, they don't want a personal relationship. They don't want anything which has got this type of uh, personal nature. And so they are attracted in the modern age more to impersonalism. And now this is being uh, further complicated by the whole computer. Instead of a personal relationship, you can have a relationship with your computer, video games, and so on. So, I read an article uh, that in England, the uh, biggest uh, cause of breaking up marriages now uh, um, is amongst a uh, very high rate in the computer operators, for various reasons. So, they were complaining that it affects dealing with machines, dealing with various things. They don't have it, they lose their ability to relate as people. Apparently, I don't know the details of why it happens, but they're complaining. In general, this is what's happening in the modern world. People are becoming more and more impersonal. And then the natural syndrome is either to desire complete sense gratification or to desire complete annihilation. Due to the frustrations become so great. So actually, Krishna consciousness is the real positive alternative. And the thing we have to watch out for is not to uh, fall into the trap of fearing the personal relationships of Krishna consciousness, the relationship with Krishna, the whole spiritual variety, that somehow this is also going to be a material frustrating situation. That actually in the relationship with Krishna, everything that happens is actually completely satisfying. Right. Someone, when you describe how Mother Yasoda was lamenting because Krishna had gone to uh, Dwarka and left Vrindavan. And so it sounds like it's a material thing that why she's uh, crying for Krishna. So this is what's the difference here. Mother is crying for the son. The difference is that uh, in material life, we're not the body. It's, uh, it's Even though there is some, uh, the closest thing to love is there, but because the basic uh, relationship is on a material level, ultimately it's not completely satisfying. But because thinking about Krishna, desiring Krishna, lamenting for Krishna, being with Krishna is all not different, it's all on the absolute platform. That if you were to offer Mother Yasoda that you can trade that in for anything else, or give you another son, or anything, so that she's actually completely uh, satisfied within that relationship. And then 
the intense meditation of Krishna through this devotional involvement, that Krishna actually appears before them. Just like when uh, Mother Yasoda came as Sachimata, the son of the mother of Lord Chaitanya, she was offering various offerings to uh, her deity, but she was thinking that if only Lord Chaitanya was here to take these offerings, if he would only be tasting these preparations I made. And then she came back and said everything was half eaten, or just a little bit left. She couldn't understand why. Then when Lord Chaitanya came to uh, Navadvip, in uh, some time later, just after ten years, he came back there and allowed Mother Sachi to just to meet her. Really, she came over and saw him and said, "Remember that day you offered? You were thinking like this, and then all the prasadam was the place where I was personally came and ate. And I come every day and eat, but you don't see me. So you don't feel that. Uh, don't feel bad that I'm not, I'm, I'm coming every day and taking." your offerings. So one of the places where Lord Chaitanya always is, is wherever Mother Sachi is offering her prashad, her boga to Lord Chaitanya. He's always there to The real thing is that in the real relationship, which is not based just upon... So even even a mother loves a son. I mean, that's a natural love. Some, there was once a, a Prabhupada asked a mother that, why do you love your child? He says, well, it's my duty for Krishna. I just I says, no, you love. You know, he says, why are you at, uh, at, you know, why are you going through all this uh, care? This uh, he says, you know, my duty to Krishna and so many. They said, no, you love your child. See, it's natural for a mother to love the child. This is natural. So the Krishna conscious is not to interrupt the natural flows in that sense, natural emotions. But then if you really love your child, then the next thing is, what's the best thing I can give my child? That's Krishna consciousness. That's spiritual. That's to free the child from the cycle of birth and death. Rather than trying to relate it to some kind of, you know, it's my duty. or this. No, actually, there's a natural affection that grows there between. This is some, even though it may be due to material, uh, uh, due to material kind of relation, but that's, a, that's not in itself uh, false. It may be temporary. Because why? When we leave this body, then there's no more connection. Where that son is going to go or that daughter is going to go, where the mother and father, they all go their different way. Then just during this lifetime, there's some temporary connection. Is there? But if we can translate that into a permanent uh, assistance, see, that has some real value. So that's the whole problem, is that not that the relationship itself is uh, it's incomplete because uh, of the various other material considerations that come in it. And sometimes it may be pure, sometimes it just may be attraction for one's own sense gratification, and one becomes very attached and thinks that that's actually love, when in fact it's, it's, it's a very little love, primarily it's a type of lust or material attachment. But when we put that in relation to Krishna, because we are part of Krishna. So our fully just serving Krishna for his satisfaction automatically satisfies our senses. Just like the hand serving the body. You can say, well, the hand, why is it love? If the hand was a person serving the body, had an individual consciousness, you see, but still was a part, then it could be termed as a relationship of love. But it's a spontaneous, by serving the body, it's also getting its own benefit. But in that consciousness, we don't have to think that I'm doing this because I'm getting the benefit. You see, whether we think that or not, if we even just absorb ourselves that, uh, in serving Krishna, you see, we actually immediately get uh, satisfied. We just uh, had Radhastami. This phenomena that the devotee of Krishna, the devotee of God and serving God, because so much transcendental happiness is the basic thing that why Lord Chaitanya came in the material world. That he saw, Krishna saw that Radharani, my greatest devotee, is experiencing such transcendental ecstasy serving me. That I as the master in the master position do not experience that much transcendental ecstasy. Being kind, he could be conscious that she was experiencing more ecstasy than he was of a different kind. And, and there are other various factors. So he decided that he wanted to also experience from his own subjective point of view. 
actually what was that uh, what did they see in him what was the uh, ecstasy there the happiness they were experiencing so he came took the mood of Radharani and came as Lord Chaitanya his own devotee so although we may be by nature part of Krishna we are very minute but our relationship with Krishna as his devotee is not an inferior position it's not a, a, a position, it's not a question of inferior or superior. Krishna may be predominating and we may be predominated. But within that relationship is perfect and complete. It's not an inferior, it just happens to be the reciprocal relationship. And within that, we can even experience uh, the maximum amount of transcendental ecstasy, which will be completely satisfying to us and which is the relationship we're really hankering for. We won't even be satisfied by the annihilate. We don't actually annihilate it. What happens is for that period of time that we're in nirvana or that we're in the Brahma Jyoti, we just lose our awareness of our personal identity. And after some time, again, we fall down from that position because it's an unnatural state. Our nature is to be always active. So actually what we're hankering for is not uh, this impersonal thing. We're actually hankering for our relationship with Krishna. This is the culmination of self-realization. Is to actually realize our eternal spiritual identity and our eternal relationship with the Supreme Person. But it's so esoteric. This is the most secret of all secrets. But normally people are absorbed in material consciousness. To get to that level, one has to be uh, completely uh, spiritually conscious. In the Bible, the holy name of God is guarded with such a secret that it would never be spoken out loud. It would only be given from one priest to the other. This is the basic Vedic, same system as there. The guru would give the disciple the mantra. It's Lord Chaitanya who is actually, by his mercy, he's opened up the doors that everyone can be given this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Before, Hare Krishna would be given only uh, to initiates. The Lord Chaitanya has uh, protected that, no, there won't be any offense if you give people this Hare Krishna Maha Mantra chanting. So this is a very great facility that we can chant these names of uh, God, these transcendental vibrations, and we can actually very quickly become purified and be reinstated in our personal relationship with Krishna. So as we are trying to please Krishna, then we become pleased. Our Vali wasn't satisfied in his position. When he finally surrendered to Krishna, then he, then even though Krishna tested him in various ways, when he surrendered, then he became completely satisfied. And then his guru, so-called guru, he uh, admitted that he had actually committed a great offense and he had gone against these scriptures. But he was very attached to his material position. In other words, if his disciples stopped becoming the ruler of the universe, then he stopped becoming the spiritual master of the ruler of the universe. So he wasn't thinking of the best interest of a disciple spiritually, but he was thinking of his material position. And he, as long as he was in that material position, then he would be in a higher, he was in a very good position as a spiritual master. So that type of spiritual master should be avoided that simply trying to uh, get some kind of material, personal benefit from the disciple. So, and in fact, uh, the Sukracharya, he then uh, later apologized and he also glorified that by the holy name everything is made perfect. So under certain circumstances, if one may have taken initiation from a guru and later finds out that the guru has given bad instruction, which is against the Shastra, which is contradicting the previous gurus, or somehow that person was, is not a Vaishnava, is not a devotee of Krishna, then one has to give him up. There's no offense for that. Rather, there's offense if you realize that, that the person, what does guru mean? Guru means representative of Krishna. He is not to give his own idea, but he is to represent what is the actual version of the Shastra without distortion, 
what is the actual words of Krishna? He has an understanding of the scripture, he's living the scripture, and he's explaining to his students, to his disciples. If he changes that, or gives his own idea, his own theories, he's not actually guru. And that's why Prabhupada, when 1936, when he gave the, the Vyas Puja, you can read that Vyas Puja offering, it's in every Vyas Puja for Prabhupada, he explains that guru is one. If you say guru, that my guru, your guru, everyone's guru is one. Because if they're a real guru, that means they're all representing Krishna. So there won't be any difference. Two things equal to the same thing are equal to each other. If one guru is perfectly representing Krishna and the other guru is perfectly representing Krishna, that means that there is no difference between them. But if they're not perfect, if they're giving some different idea based on their own mental concoction, then they're not guru at all. My definite guru means to be representing. So they may be called as guru, but they're not actually guru. So therefore the question, giving up one's guru doesn't really come. If you realize that someone's not representing Krishna, is not serving Krishna, is not a devotee of Krishna, that means he's not guru. Even he may say he's a guru. There's so many gurus like that in the world who are not actually representing the Supreme Personality of God here. Therefore, they're not actually gurus, even though they may be called like that. So the real qual the first qualification to be a spiritual master is one has to be a devotee of Krishna. And the second is that one has to be repeating the words of Krishna as it is. And the third is that one should have a good character. And before initiation, a student should actually test, see, whether the guru has these qualifications. Because upon taking initiation, then one should be following the advice of the guru without question. I mean, not without question, they can have questions, but not without challenging. If you don't understand something, if there's some... Uh, you know, misconception, that should be all cleared up. It's not a blind that one should blindly follow without even understanding why or without with having many doubts. But it shouldn't be a challenge. I won't follow you. Even if you say that, you know, just, you know, that type of challenging is over. You see, beforehand, one might even challenge, how do we know this, how do we know that? But it's not the actual method. Method is submissive inquiry. Doing service, submissive inquiry, surrender, and then taking the instructions. And then when one sees that it's actually working, I'm becoming detached from material life, I'm getting some relief, I'm getting some spiritual inspiration. You see, then one should take initiation from the spiritual master and formally maintain that uh, re relationship uh, eternally, birth after birth even, until one reaches Krishna. Even at that time, that relationship is there in a slightly different way. But this, the guru also has to check the disciple, test the disciple. The disciple should basically be faithful. You see, there's no value to initiating a disciple if they don't have faith. If they're not going, if you tell the disciple that no, under this circumstance, this is the best thing for you, and I don't accept. You see, then what's the value of initiating such a disciple? They won't take, if just like if you, in the material where you go to a doctor, you know the doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. He may or may not know. You go to ten doctors, they tell you ten different things. So it's a question of faith. Who are you going to follow? You have to follow some doctor, otherwise you're not going to get cured. So in the spiritual life, whatever the, 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 the spiritual master has to be found someone who knows what are the actual words of Krishna, what has been handed down, and then ultimately one has to put faith that the advice that's going to be given is going to be something which is going to be pure and going to be effective. If you don't have the faith, then it's very difficult. So before initiation, one is uh, supposed to see, you know, by practical application, by inquiry, and when one actually develops the faith and sees that, yes, this is a bona fide spiritual master, seeing the description from the scriptures, seeing the description from great devotees, what are the qualifications of a spiritual master, 
then one has to follow those instructions after initiation. So the spiritual master see whether the person is faithful, whether they are mature enough, they developed enough faith, you see, that they actually want to follow spiritual life. And the second thing, whether they have a basically good character. That's why we let people take six months, see, practice, informally, as a devotee. And if you want, if you feel, and then also in that six months, uh, practice regulative principles, you see, whatever you might have been before, but uh, develop good character. Let's see person's already been a vegetarian or in some cases Prabhupada has even uh, reduced the period of six months. But uh, in general, in this age, everybody has bad habits, so it's good to have that period. Both that they can themselves see that, yes, this is actually working for me, this is actually what I want, actually I want to follow the spiritual master, because once one takes initiation, it shouldn't be whimsically broken. Right? Even when people get married, they say that... Uh, they're supposed to uh, serve each other for the whole life, but now people break it very easily because of various reasons. But this is not a material relationship. It's not even for one life. But the oath has said that I'm going to, until I reach, until, you know, for birth after birth, I'm going to follow this life, and even in future lives, I'm going to follow the spiritual master. One may not forget this life, may in the next life maintain the same memory, or in many different ways may meet the same spiritual master if one hasn't finished the business. So one's obligation is to continue following. <coughs> so it's a very big responsibility. So before one takes that, uh, we also give some time. Don't rush into it. It's not that Prabhupada said that we're not after getting so many followers like stars in the sky. We want moons. One moon can uh, take away all the darkness. Now, on Ekadasi is the rising moon. Krishna is born in the waning moon, and this is what we call the waxing, the rising moon. So, the waxing moon. So now the moon is very bright. So like that, in Mayapur especially, when we have a full moon, then you can see practically from miles away, you can see, because it's so... There's no street lights, there's no, it's just there in the, you know, on the Ganges side, very peaceful. In the dark moon, you can't see anything, it's just pitch black. You can see miles away different uh, city lights, not cities, but little glows from, even from the railway stations. Some ten miles away, you can see a little light glow there. So the thieves always come in the dark moon night. <laughs> <laughs> That's when uh, they make their attacks. But uh, in the full moon night, it's so bright that uh, practically you can read a book. I've taken a book outside, and you can actually see the letters. It's so bright in my book. No smog, of course. <laughs> so we want people like that, the disciples should be like a moon. They should be able to, in other words, what, get, not only get the light, but be able to reflect it to others. <coughs> So just in India, people, they all come up and say, I like to take initiation. Sometimes they go up to the, you know, Brahmacharis and Arjis <laughs> on the street when they're doing Sankirtan. Can they have Diksha? <laughs> they don't, because it's just become like an institution. You can, they, they look, like when we're preaching Nam Hatta, we go, there was one family was initiated by Bhakti Siddhanta. And their grandchildren, they took initiation from some little family guru in Navadvi. And uh, the preacher asked, so why have you done this? And uh, why didn't you stay in our same, you know, line? They said, well, your, your line is very strict. You say no eating of meat, fish, and egg. But the other guru, he said we could eat fish and take tea. So we found it was better to go with him. <laughs> You know, they like Kmart or something. <laughs> they wanted a cheaper way out. They weren't thinking that uh, what was the goal of taking a spiritual master? What was the purpose? They're just thinking that, all right, 
Because in India, everyone, it's just like if you baptize somebody, everybody wants to have the guru, must have guru. They know the Shastra says everyone has to have a spiritual master. What is the responsibility of the disciple to the spiritual master? What is the, what is the purpose of having a spiritual master? This thing they've forgotten, many people. So they just, so then, they, all right, they have to have a guru. So some of them in Bengal, they know it should be a Vaishnava. Okay, some of them are Vaishnava. But then they take who's ever the easiest. All right, you can do this, you can do that. Okay, I'll take it. <laughs> so then it becomes very cheap. You see, and those people, are, what spiritual advancement can they make? So <clears throat> that was uh, that's the basis why this Krishna conscious movement is actually progressing. You see, because Krishna is there, of course, he's helping from within. Desiring to achieve the absolute truth, we want to realize ourselves, want to realize God, want to overcome material uh, things, material obstacles. That's from within our heart, Krishna is supporting. But the spiritual master is Krishna helping from without side, guiding us, helping us uh, specifically, externally, and, and even reinforcing, confirming the very things that we feel inspired from our own heart. So the faith in the spiritual master, just like Bali Maharaj could conquer the whole universe, the faith in spiritual master is the basic strength. That's what's making the Krishna conscious movement spread all over the world. Any Indian, when they come and they see the, the thing they comment upon, is that in your movement you have taught, you see, Prabhupada has established the real standard of guru and disciple faith, guru and disciple reciprocation. <coughs> The Prabhupada gave his complete life for his disciples. He's traveling all over the world. He's I have forty million dollars worth of temples. Normally a person like that, if he had someone he left it now, it's even more probably if he considered the whole world. Says, but I never stay any place more than three, four days. Mm -hmm. I say, I have no time to stay anywhere. Because, because he wants to continually meet all of the disciples, all of the devotees, try to encourage them. He's always ate the same three japatis and uh, four or five japatis, whatever. <coughs> and uh, everything is used for Krishna. Nowadays, you read in the paper, you find people have you know so-called gurus and leaders. They are purchasing newspapers and all kinds of things in different foreign countries and uh, amassing personal fortunes. Obviously, they're exploiting people. I don't know, I mean, it seems that way. I didn't go into it. You can never I mean, It seems to be that way without going into it. So a disciple might offer some car or something to a spiritual master so they can do their service. But the spiritual master's lifestyle, his, purpose, his serving of Krishna, why should that change? There's no other, apart from the Vedic culture, there's no standard. And within Vedic culture, the standard is very explicit. What can be done? In the service of Krishna, you can utilize practically everything. But there's a very fine line. What is the difference between sense gratification and doing things for Krishna? If it's actually utility, it has some utility for it advancing the cause of Krishna consciousness, never Maya, even if it's materially optimal. And if it is not useful for advancing Krishna consciousness, then we don't have to take it. So this is the basic strength of our movement, is the disciple and guru relationship. So this whole, in a sense, this is a unique thing, because Bali Maharaj, he had given his faith to a guru. But in the final test, his guru misguided. So that was that. That is like the most unfortunate thing. If a if a person he puts his faith in a spiritual master, and the spiritual master subsequently either uh, gives a, a misguidance. It has happened. There are several scriptural instances that sometimes does happen that a guru either was initially good but then became bad, or that a guru gives a, a bad advice. And at that time, if the disciple is mature enough and actually understand the Guru is representing Krishna, now what he's saying is not representing Krishna. It's a big step. If you make the wrong 
mistake and you renounce the spiritual master, when he's actually giving the good advice, that's considered guru aparad, and that's the biggest offense. But if in fact he's no longer acting as guru, no longer representing Krishna, then one is also obliged to give him up. In this case, Bali Maharaj directly could surrender to Krishna. Krishna was right there. Krishna was saying, do something. The Guru admitted, this is Krishna. He's saying to do this, but I'm saying, don't do it. All right, then I give you up. You're not Guru. If you're admitting that this is God, and you're supposed to be his representative, you're telling me not to follow him, then obviously you're not his representative. Therefore, I don't follow you. It was very clear cut. So a person should be very clear. And then by put it, once you find the bona fide spiritual master, one should put faith in the spiritual master. And then take uh, the guidance and the help that is there to be offered. I remember one time there was a devotee, Prabhupada came, I believe it was to Calcutta, when I was there. And there was a devotee who <coughs> was a completely frustrated when he was looking, looking down, looking sad. Prabhupada came in the room, it was there, and the devotee came and said, Why are you looking so sad? He said, in the presence of Guru, the disciples should never be unhappy. So what is the use of having a spiritual master when you're in his presence, when he's there present and you're still unhappy? If you have something on your mind, if there's some problem, you should reveal it to the spiritual master and then you should take his guidance to solve the problem. Therefore, in the presence of a spiritual master, there's no cause for the disciple to be unhappy because the spiritual master can solve any problem. Simply by following his instruction, the problem will be solved. Without the spiritual master, one's alone. Without a spiritual master at all, one's hopeless and say one has spiritual master but he's far away. At that time, maybe sometime, one may feel some inconvenience. But right in the presence of the spiritual master, there's no reason, there's no cause to be in anxiety. You can express your mind, you can say what's on your, uh, what's your problem and the thing can be solved. You can get guidance how to, how to rectify those obstacles, how to overcome the difficulty. And then a person was still in some kind of weird mode, you see, and Tamasic he just wasn't receptive. And Prabhupada said, I order you to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> you must be happy in my breath. So sometimes see of course difficulties happen in a person's spiritual life, so that's what the spiritual master is there. Because we're not pure enough, even Krishna is in our heart, we're not pure enough to get the message from Krishna, what to do, what not to do. So we don't know if it's our mind that's telling us, due to our previous conditioning, or whether it's actually the super soul telling us. So we verify, major thing, we verify with the spiritual master, or his representative. So this Vamana avatar pastime, has got many of these instructions to give us. The importance of surrendering to God, to Krishna, the, the, the wonderfulness of the personal relationship the devotee has with the Supreme Person. Right. So much, once you surrender to Krishna, then there's no more worry. Krishna is taking complete care. Through the spiritual master, one surrenders to Krishna, he's protected. Krishna says, my devotee shall never perish. Then another instruction we get is that uh, what is the relationship of guru and disciple? So, so many instructions we can take. So it's not just that the pastime of Vamana and Bali Maharaj are given just as an entertainment that we're given some kind of a story. There's an inner purpose that when you study under the guidance of a bona fide spiritual master, the particular pastimes that are going on in the Puranas, that they have a wealth of significance. 
And we can gain a specific instruction by seeing how these great devotees have acted under these circumstances. And we are supposed to follow in their example. Mahajana Janogatha Sapuntha. In other words, they under certain stressful situations, certain crises situations, certain specific instances, they have been put to the test. And they, because they are great souls, they have passed it. They've done the proper thing. <laughs> or even they make a mistake. So whatever it may, and then they then we also see how they have to suffer for it. So there has a specific instructions for us that we should follow the great soul, the good examples, and those who have failed, we should avoid their example. It's not just uh, you know passing the time. There's a very great instruction by hearing and actually understanding the mercy that Krishna has for every individual uh, person. How is actually their well-wisher and friend? And understanding that all these spirits should be kind of very purifying. And if we continually to hear these pastimes in the proper mood of faith and open-mindedness, you see, even if a new person kind of might not have full faith in Krishna, if he just takes it from, all right, let me try to understand that these people are saying that Krishna and these various avatars, incarnations, are God. Let's give it the benefit of the doubt. It might be. Let me try to understand from that angle of vision, does it make any sense or not? Just a little bit of open mind if someone tries to understand, just to uh, understand the instructions that are given, what would be the meaning of that? In such a case, that person can also become purified. Just if a person comes right from the beginning completely skeptical, I won't believe in anything, I'm not going to hear... Are you people a bunch of liars? I won't listen. You know, of course, what can you, you know, a person won't even give an open hearing. Even a judge is supposed to be neutral, right? Then what can you say to the person? Therefore, we don't preach to such people. It's a waste of time. Unless they want to at least give a receptive hearing, you see. Whether it's with faith, or whether it's just as a neutral party, open mind, giving some minor faith, slight benefit of the doubt just to just try to understand the subject matter from a neutral position. In either case, then they can gain something spiritual. Because they are submissively hearing. So this is a basic process of Krishna consciousness. It's the same process been practiced for millions of years, guru and disciple. And now once the person understands something, then you digest it, you hear it, try to digest it, try to understand it. If there's any indigestion that comes up, any kind of doubt or a little bit unclarity, then one takes it out and again offers up some questions to further understand the matter and then again tries to digest it. If it's fully digest, then you try to preach it to others and then it becomes realized knowledge. As you're preaching, then the thing even becomes more clear. Because then you have to apply it. You have to apply it in the preaching means not to individual people. When you explain to them, naturally in your mind you're applying it to their lifetime, to their situation, to that particular circumstance. So then when you're repeating it, it's becoming realized in your own mind. And then it becomes very firmly uh, fixed. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. See, tomorrow I'd like to, uh, any devotees that would like to meet me, I'd like to make a schedule during the day, we can have, uh, try to meet as many devotees as possible. I was wondering about uh, this situation. If one is uh, lamenting, oh, I miss being in this other temple because of this certain service, which was so wonderful. I miss this devotee, or something like that. Is that is there any value to that lamentation? Is that remembering, you know, your service? Is there some, you know, what's going on? You know, I think if you're in one temple, you know, another temple. You feel like the grass always seems greener on the other side of the fence. <laughs> In devotional service, and the there are various factors to consider. 
sometimes there's a a certain need. to uh, spread Krishna consciousness or to do a particular service for the spiritual master. And that that may uh, mean that a person has to take on some kind of an austerity. And they have to go into a, a situation which would be less comfortable. And for doing that, that is a type of an austerity. But it might be necessary in devotional service. So, uh, voluntarily accepting that type of a situation is uh, more purifying. Just like uh, to go out and open temples and to preach is always a, is an austere program. To live in the Holy Dham is where the preaching always begins, the Holy Dhams. <coughs> This is the most protected place. There you have all devotees. The environment is perfect. To want to, you know, to go out in the in society and open up a, ta- a center of preaching, then there's a, you're always going to be confronted by various kinds of doubting people, challenging people, even aggressive people. In the preaching, you may have various devotees who are not always as compatible as other combinations. So one has to weigh that if it's actually beneficial for serving Guru and Krishna to be in a specific situation, even it might be somewhat, you know, less comfortable than another, but if it's actually helping the Krishna conscious movement, helps helping the spiritual master, then one may accept such an austerity. And one advice is that uh, initially we can serve uh, in association with like-minded devotees. It makes it easier. But uh, that's not the most important thing. But that is, uh, that it makes it easier. So one should, if one's having a lot of difficulty with certain devotees, then the spiritual master may authorize one to live in a situation where it's more compatible. But uh, ultimate uh, consideration is what's going to be, uh, what's ever going to be more, if we have the strength to accept some inconvenience, if it's actually more beneficial for serving Krishna, then uh, accepting that will be more purifying for us. Even if we're hankering for the association of some devotee, it's not a not unnatural uh, Narottam Das Thakur always wanted to have the association of Srinivasacharya and his disciple Ramachandra Kaviraj. Even though Srinivasacharya and Narottam Das Thakur were practically on the level of God brothers, and Ramachandra Kaviraj was a disciple of his God brother, in a sense, although they weren't exactly, didn't have the same guru, but in the sense of their stature, they were in that level. But Ramachandra was such a nice devotee. He had such an intimate relationship with him that he uh, he was he wanted to have his association. So he sang that song, Ramachandra Shanga Mangi. And I'm always uh, hankering for the association of Ramachandra. But you can be guaranteed that Narottam Das Thakur never avoided doing any preaching or doing any kind of uh, devotional service you know, because of the consideration that Ramachandra he didn't have the association of Ramachandra Kavir, but he might have hankered that it would be nice to have his association. And whenever available, he would take it. But they took the primal duty, was the first thing was serving uh, the, the Guru and Guranga. The second consideration was trying to have as good association as possible. We need good association of devotees who are more advanced, who are more steady, now, of course, you have the 20th century, you can again get on the phone. If you have a devotee that, uh, by the talking with that devotee, they give some kind of inspiration, one service to Guru, one can phone him up or her up. Or write a letter. Keep association that way. Sometimes you can associate. Even by uh, now, like we have our reunions, we like association with certain devotees. Just uh, I have a very nice 
relationship, I'm always hankering for the association of Baba Nanda Maharaj. He did, Vishnu Pais. He just phoned me up today and told me about uh, different things that are happening, and then I was telling him about the recent developments in Mayapur, India. You know, it was very nice to have a little association. He said, I was just praying the Radha Madhava. And then I heard that you were in America, so I just phoned up. And I told him that how Radha Madhava televised through over the whole India. He said, they, I just phoned Calcutta, they didn't tell me any of these things. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something else. <laughs> they probably didn't know because when I went to the uh, South and then I got the information. Mm. See, sitting in Calcutta, they always tell you it's all the India television, but you never really believe that it really goes all over India. Don't know if they have it that far together. <laughs> but people in South India did see it. So anyway, we can get association from devotees now. And not that every moment you have to have, you know, someone holding the hand, so to speak, uh, for association. Although it's nice, it's encouraging. We have to see where is our service going to, is more needed also. Where we can be most utilized. If we leave our service, will a particular situation suffer? There are many considerations. In any case, a disciple should, then, when the spiritual master is present, then he can take this guidance of the spiritual master and follow those instructions, that's more important. Just like Prabhupada would send someone to Africa. Now that person probably is the furthest thing you want to do was preach in the Africa. And that what would be considered, you know, it's much nicer to preach in, say, America at the outset, you see, or preach in some other country, you know, where the God brothers are all there, different people. But no, they were requested, please preach in Africa. So they went there, but once they went there, they could feel presence of Krishna, they could see that the people there were receptive, but it was difficult physically, it might have been difficult culturally, but because the following that they became stronger, it was able to counteract whatever obstacles they had, there was a special mercy for them. Prabhupada, when he used to come to Calcutta, he said, I don't know how you people are living here. He said, I couldn't even live in Calcutta, I was born here. He said, I left Calcutta when I was a Grihasta and moved to other cities. I couldn't take, you know, I didn't like it. But because you're here, because it's my birthplace, and because you're preaching Krishna consciousness, it's the, it's the biggest city and the place where Lord Chaitanya's movement started in Gauravumi and Bengal. You see, I'm very, very grateful to you. Krishna will give you a thousand of times more mercy because you're taking on, you see, this austerity. Look at this an austerity. We didn't think it was much of an austerity, at least some of us didn't. Because we knew it was pleasing the Prabhupada, after some acclimatization, it doesn't really seem that austere. Yeah. That way, uh, Westerners, when they take Krishna consciousness, uh, they actually get a special mercy because uh, their habits and their lifestyle is so much different that Krishna recognizes for them it's a big sacrifice. But once you become a devotee, you don't really feel it's a sacrifice because uh, you're happy. And then and with all these so-called material situations, you weren't happy. But just like when the Indian people, they, they tend to always glorify. We always we want to have some foreigners, some foreigners, I mean to say, Americans and Westerners, go to Asia and India and to help preach there. Because when they see how the, so the year the Americas looked around the world as the richest country in the world, streets are lined with gold. We know that the asphalt is chipping here and the bridges are collapsing and, you know, it's not all roses, that uh, there's a lot of violence and so on. But, I mean, the, from the other third world, they kind of think that America, land of the free, roads are all, you know, paved with gold. So here they see that here all these people are born with a silver spoon in their mouth. They're taking, uh, in India especially, when they see uh, the foreigners and they're vegetarian and they're chanting and they say, oh, they're pure brahmanas. They offer the greatest respect. Oh, how have you given up all the luxuries? 
in India, especially in Bangladesh and Bengal, when uh, when uh, I've seen that when a foreign, you know, American Maharaji devotee, Vaishnavi goes there, I've seen as many as 150 Bengali women bow down at their feet wanting to, you know, they say, oh, we've given up so many, you must be a great devotee. Because we can't even give up this or that, you know. In their humility, they think, where is the folly? Such a great devotee. So it's definitely, uh, in, from one angle of vision, it may be austere. From a subjective point, sometimes it doesn't seem austere. But whatever, if we take some kind of austerity, even we might be hankering, oh, this was very nice. Prabhupada, he came here. He thought, what am I doing here? These people are so passionate and so ignorant. Sometimes he would think, maybe I should go back to the Dham, will I be able to, but hey, no, I have this, the order of Guru, I should take this up. So he had that, to, that order of the spiritual master driving him. So he continued to preach Krishna consciousness. It's like sometimes we may hanker for a particular devotee or servant. We have to see that, that even though we might have liked that situation or felt more comfortable, what's actually going more necessary What's going to be more pleasing to our spiritual master? That personal service to Guru is also a type of surrender. We might want to do something for Krishna, but if it's too much what we want to do, it's not really devotion. It's actually like karma yoga, offering the fruits of our activities. And bhakti yoga means that we do what ultimately Krishna wants. Man proposes, God disposes. We may propose, but Krishna may or may not accept it. He may actually want us to do, like Arjuna proposed, I don't want to fight. I think I'll become a Babaji now. I'm just going to be a beggar. So Krishna didn't accept that. He said, no, I didn't train you. I didn't bring you in this world as a king, as a Kshatriya that finally come to the battlefield. You want to become a Babaji. You want to become some kind of a beggar. I want you to defeat all these demons. I want you to establish a God-conscious uh, government in the world. And if you don't do it, I'm going to do it anyway. But I brought you here for that purpose. So then when Arjuna could realize this, Krishna is desire, all right, so. Is that okay? Any questions, Bhakti Sanders? Bhakti Jan? Um, sometimes when I'm in the Guru's and professional service, I find that I have almost two things I have material motives behind it, and like I said, I'm anchored to get rid of these uh, material anxieties to get rid of this bodily concept. And I, I get into further anxiety because I, I'm aware that I guess I think that maybe I should be more trying to, to do this service to where I'd love, love for God, which I feel to some extent that this is not there. And I'll be more anxious to get rid of this material drive than I am to say God sometimes. And I'm anxious to know if that's just part of this process. That's why in the initial stages we do devotional service according to rules and regulations that the scripture says certain things. So even initially we can't claim that we have love for God. We may have a desire for love for God. We may have others so still residual desires may be there. So, but when we follow whatever is according to the scripture, according to the rules and regulations, according to, more as a, as a regulation, that I should do it, it's my duty. So when one's not doing something out of duty, that, that would imply it's not that spontaneous a love, you see, as doing something that spontaneously out of love. But by acting in that way, because if we did love Krishna, we would be doing something like that. So we're doing the closest thing to what we would do if we had love for Krishna. But we may be doing out of a sense of duty, out of intellectual understanding that this is the order of the Shastra and the Guru. So we do it as a matter of duty. By practicing in that way, by surrendering, we get purified. And with the purification, gradually our spontaneous attraction for Krishna increases. Our spontaneous uh, devotion increases. And then gradually a stage reaches where the mechanical process of following the rules and regulations in a matter of duty is transformed into a spontaneous stage. 
first one spontaneously is eager, very eager to follow the rules and regulations, and it comes to a higher level where then one is uh, completely dedicated to following whatever the orders of the spiritual master are. And uh, irregardless of any other consideration. So that Raganuga stage is considered to be a, the preliminary stage of love for Godhead. And then when we have complete realization of Krishna and ourself, and at that stage we're in prema. So that comes, uh, that's the final culmination, that's the complete stage of liberation. But even before that, with ecstatic devotion, different stages are there, spontaneous devotion. So in the beginning, that may happen, but one, by that's why it's called the yoga of intelligence, Buddha yoga. By intelligence, you have to see that what is the, the thing which is most pleasing to Krishna, what's going to be most beneficial for my Krishna consciousness. Sometimes the guru may ask a disciple, to do a particular service, it might be actually the thing they wanted to do. Then because you think, well, my goodness, that's exactly the material desire I have, but I'm being asked to do that. So then maybe I shouldn't do it because uh, it's some kind of maya. No, that, that also, you can't renounce it even if you like doing it, just to be artificially <laughs> austere. Right. Someone might love to uh, eat, you know, so they artificially, they don't want to eat. They don't want to, they say, no, you have to take this feast today. And they think, no, even I like it, so I won't do it. That's all artificial. So you don't do things like that. Sometimes you might be asked to do something you don't like to do. You say. Maybe someone asks you, please sweep the floor today. Say, I don't like sweeping the floor. I would much rather make the flower garlands. <laughs> right. But it needs to be, so then one sweeps the floor, that all right, this is my service today, so I'm sweeping. And this way one gets purified. And then one starts to realize that no matter what the service is to Krishna, that the transcendental bliss and the relationship with Krishna is there. Sometimes it might be something very compatible with what uh, our present frame of mind is. Sometimes it might be something not exactly what we want to do. But by practicing, automatically one will be put in certain circumstances with sometimes even the, the, what seems to be the difficult circumstance, we shouldn't avoid these difficulties. That's also a type of seasoning. That's, what's a, that's a type of purification. You can't polish the brass. You want to polish it without rubbing. You see, there has to be some abrasion there. Our attachments are there. Sometimes we have to, we have to uh, you know, accept that what, what that little inconvenience, that little mental obstacle that's there is actually attachment. And by tolerating that, we become actually more fixed in spiritual. Then we're, we're not, we become freed from being dependent on our mind. But even the mind might, uh, materialistic mind might uh, be comfortable in a certain situation. So we're always striving to achieve that situation. But that's not, that's not the best position to be in. Then we become actually dependent on those situations. But if actually we can surrender to Krishna, then irregardless of the situation, we'll be satisfied, we'll be self-situated, we'll be atma rama chamunaya, we'll be on the transcendental platform. A person might be very attached to very regulated life, very specific situation, but suddenly now the third world war may come, there are going to be bombs everywhere, and we're going to have people have to do various services in a more spontaneous way. People might be coming to the devotees for uh, various type of spiritual guidance and help. So at that time, then, uh, you know, whatever amount of spiritual strength a person has been able to develop, that's what's going to pull one through. You know, under the perfect, ideal, protected situation, one can maintain, anyone can maintain, you see, if they have the desire but under difficult situations, then one's put to test. So in the devotional service, such things happen. Krishna does it, that he puts us sometimes to the test. It's a type of seasoning. He puts us in a little crossroad where we have to decide. And by deciding towards Krishna when that comes, to do whatever is going to be more favorable to Krishna, then whether it's favorable to us or to our own mental idea at that point, or whether it's even slightly exactly not what we wanted. 
then we actually become transcendental. And that gives us actually a uh, deep strength. 